So we are now at chapter two. Uh, this is Guildhall, where we will see that feature in this chapter. Um, to read this chapter, we have Mr. Shaw, head of year seven, also a PE teacher. Enjoy. Chapter two, the resistance. Gosport was governed by the Alvestocracy, which consisted of the elected members of its 17 wards and was headed by First Minister Theodore Forton, a solemnly spoken and kind water vole who had entered politics quite without intention. A shipbuilder by trade, he had successfully negotiated commerce between Gosport and its neighbouring country of Fareham, which in turn had secured the relative free flow of trade between them since 1912. I have here, said Theodore Forton in his reedy voice, a letter from Prime Minister Dennis Delaney of Portsmouth, signed by him and countersigned by Lord Admiral Grey, High Commander of the fleet of Ratufini, Jean de Guizot, he too of Portsmouth. It is dated yesterday, the 22nd of May, 1939, and reads, Dear Sirs, it will always be the misfortune of others to ignore the greater good, as it has been your misfortune of late. Times of hardship, though, may pass with cooperation fully expected and necessary for deeds to be pardoned. Of course, our more stringent capabilities have not yet been tested. I dare say there will be no end to those who volunteer to test them. Our reach is far. I am grateful to you, however, for your cooperation and will of course reward such assistance where evidenced, with the same riches in keeping with your current existence. In this regard, I have ensured your safekeeping as a gesture of my thanks and goodwill. In the following days and weeks, our advance will be robust and expedient. Any wavering in your assistance will not go unpunished. You have my assurance that the peoples of Gosport will remain unharmed if they fully cooperate and contribute to the greater good, their services to Portsmouth. Yours faithfully, Prime Minister D. Delaney. First Minister Forton placed his reading glasses on the lectern in front of him and took a long, slow, deep breath. He then looked up at his ward ministers and said somberly, So you see, there are no demands, no deal to be had, nothing to be done. Agatha woke to the gentle burbling of animals outside in the street. She couldn't quite hear what was being said and was unconcerned, so turned onto her side to catch a few more minutes of rest before having to get ready for Sunday service. It was a glorious, warm, sunny morning. As she woke for the second time, she sat up in bed, stretched out her paws, yawned, swung her legs round and stood up with her eyes initially still closed. She dressed hurriedly, ran a brush through her fur, walked downstairs, had a berry cereal and a quick cup of apple juice and walked to the front door to leave, wearing her Sunday best. Agatha style and therefore scruffy of course. As she was about to leave, she saw that the morning's post had already arrived. Among the bills and many letters for her father was an unfamiliar looking envelope 
that bore the postmark of Portsmouth. Agatha placed the rest of the post on the stand in the hallway while examining the mysterious envelope that was addressed to the red occupier. As she left the cottage, she opened the letter and began reading. By command of Prime Minister Denis Delaney and by order of Admiral Jean de Guizot, High Commander of the Fleet of Ratufini, Portsmouth, are hereby granted an occupation order. By the stroke of midday on the 25th of June 1939, all Red Squirrel occupiers of Gosport are to vacate their dwellings. It is ordered the following. Vacate your illegal dwelling. Take only what you can carry and of that which is valuable to you. One suitcase per squirrel is permitted only. Travel south to Camp Browndown, Gosport, where you will be met by the Gizor army. Limited transportation will be provided for those impaired or infirm. All red squirrels are to be temporarily housed by Portsmouth in Camp Browndown by midday on the 25th day of June 